The intersection of Vassar Street and Main Streets in Cambridge, Massachusetts is considered to be one of the most innovative places in the world. Right near the MIT campus, not too far from Harvard University and other world-renowned institutes, this proximity has allowed the collaboration between some of the world's greatest scientific minds. Before, it was largely an empty space filled with warehouses and parking lots, and eventually research and tech buildings began to pop up, including, as one journalist somewhat harshly described, the dumpy building that houses the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research. If you're not familiar with this term, it's not the most flattering. I hope he only meant the first definition. He sees dumpy, I see a distinguished building, but I may be a little bit biased because this is where I started my scientific career. And this is where I learned firsthand how to solve a genetic disorder. The Whitehead Institute was also the single largest contributor to the Human Genome Project. The Human Genome Project was a global collaboration of 20 institutions in six countries that started in 1990. The primary goal of this project was to generate the complete sequence of all the DNA in our cells, our genomes. Completion of the first full sequence was announced 20 years ago in 2003, 13 years and several billion dollars later. This was a major scientific achievement that accelerated our understanding of human biology and laid the foundation for genomic medicine. You may have heard that just last year, we completed it again. What this means is that the technology wasn't quite sufficient at the time to actually sequence about 10% of the genome. But part of the thrill of being a scientist is that the work is really never done. With each scientific discovery, new, challenging questions arise, and our knowledge is constantly challenged and adjusted. But like all scientific advancements, the Human Genome Project was built on decades of prior research. The very first genetic map was not actually of humans, it was of the fruit fly, constructed by American biologists uh, Morgan and Sturtevant in 1913. So why did these guys start with fruit flies? Why not just sequence our genomes? Well, for one, DNA sequencing didn't yet exist. Fruit flies also reach adulthood in just 10 days, and females can lay hundreds of eggs at a time. Their genomes are also relatively small, so all the DNA inside their cells are tightly coiled up into just four pairs of chromosomes, which you see here. So this is why they're called what, what we call model organisms. They allow us to study biological procedures that would be impossible in humans. We humans obviously take a little bit longer to reach adulthood, some more so than others. And we have much more complex traits and a much bigger genome with our DNA spread out over 23 chromosomes. So how did they do this? By combining male and female flies with specific combinations of eye color, body shape, or wing type, Sturtevant determined that the traits frequently inherited together are actually physically near each other on their genome, on the DNA. He was able to figure out the order of the genes in the fruit fly and by looking at how often these traits were actually inherited together. So for example, as you see here, he took a female red-eyed fly, crossed it with a white-eyed male, and then by looking at the baby flies and how often you see specific traits, he was able to painstakingly looking at thousands, maybe even millions of flies to determine the order of the genes on the chromosome. DNA sequencing was developed in the late 1970s, and the first automated DNA sequencer was introduced in 1986. It looked very similar to the machine that you see here, and these machines would be used just a few years later in the Human Genome Project. So once we knew the sequence, of the three billion letters of our DNA, we now had a template to compare newly sequenced genomes to. This is how we learned how similar we really all are. Each one of you shares 99% of your DNA with the person to your left and your right, and actually with everyone in here. So although we each share more than 99% of our DNA, 
This minute difference makes each one of us unique. No other human has the same genome, unless you're an identical twin. This is my former colleague from MIT, also a human geneticist and an identical twin. Melissa would often try to stump me with pictures of herself and her sister Megan, and was frustrated that I always managed to guess which one was her, every time. Studies of identical twins have shown that genetics is not deterministic and have helped our understanding of how much our DNA really influences the development of traits or diseases. Despite sharing the same genome and the same environment, even identical twins do not always show diseases or traits, at least not in the same way. Most genetic studies actually involve individuals that are unrelated. So we compare genomes of people with a trait or a disease to those without the trait of, or the disease. And so if a DNA mutation occurs more often in those with a, uh, with a disease, then we can say that there is an association with that trait or disease and that mutation. So the completion of the Human Genome Project was a major milestone that has really transformed our understanding of human health. But once we had the sequence, the hard work of interpreting the structure and the function of our genetic code began. In the past 20 years, scientists have been hard at work discovering common traits and diseases using approaches like this one. This is a map of the human genome. As I mentioned, our DNA is tightly coiled and separated into 23 pairs of chromosomes in each of our cells. So the first of such studies, like I just showed you, compared DNA from only about 100 patients and 50 controls. But scientists were able to find a mutation on chromosome 19, as you see here, that causes an eye disease. Since that first study in 2005, thousands more similar studies have identified thousands of genetic risk variants. Here you can barely even see the chromosome map behind all of the mutations associated with the traits on the right. These studies involve traits and diseases that are typically common in the population, meaning we have enough samples to really detect the mutation in the DNA. Rare diseases, on the other hand, are much more challenging to diagnose because they occur so infrequently in the population. In Europe, a disease is considered rare if it occurs in less than one in 2,000 people. While individually rare, more than 350 million people worldwide have a, genetic, a rare genetic disorder. And most of these do indeed have a genetic basis. Patients with undiagnosed rare diseases often spend years on a diagnostic odyssey of tests and procedures, and this can often delay getting appropriate treatment. All rare disease researchers have a diagnostic odyssey story. Mine goes back to 2012 and that dumpy building in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is Ariella. She was referred to our lab in Cambridge by her clinicians in Israel. She was diagnosed with Golden Heart Syndrome, a rare craniofacial disorder that mainly affects the development of the eyes, ears, and spine. The disorder is highly complex and symptoms can vary widely in both unrelated and related individuals. Both genetic and environmental factors have been shown to play a role in the development of the disorder. Our mission here was to determine if there was indeed a genetic cause in Ariella's case. Features of the disorder were first defined in 1952 by the Swiss ophthalmologist Maurice Goldenhar, that's why the publication was in French. And despite the more than 1,300 scientific publications on Goldenhar syndrome since then, the cause is still not well understood. Most cases of golden heart occur in families with no history of the disorder. In our case, we had a major advantage. We had the largest family tree to date of a family with the disorder. So the occurrence of golden heart in each generation of Ariella's family, as you see here, was highly suggestive of a shared genetic cause. We were fortunately able to get DNA from three generations, including Ariella, her mom, her cousin, and her grandmother. Okay, so how do we actually find the causal mutation? How do we look for a mutation that causes their disorder? Well, we start by collecting their DNA, sequencing them, and then comparing the sequencing data to the reference human genome. 
So this all looks very straightforward, but sequencing files that I work with on a daily basis look like this. And these files have tens of millions of lines, so it's a lot of data to sort through. What we do is we start by comparing the patient sample to the human reference genome. So that white sequence you see at the top, that was the result of the effort of the Human Genome Project. It's now a template to which we can compare new genomes to. We sequence the same region many times to make sure that we have actually found a true mutation. And here you can see that part that's highlighted in red. This is indeed a mutation in a patient sample uh, that differs from that reference sequence. So the real challenge is distinguishing harmful mutations from mostly harmless changes in our genomes. Those three billion letters when DNA is uncoiled, can reach two meters long inside each of our cells. That's a lot of mutations to sort through. Much like detective work, our job is to find the guilty mutation among the mostly innocent DNA. It's actually really just a numbers game. So what we decided to do is to first only focus on 1% of the genome, the part of the genome that contains genes reducing our search space to 30 million culprits rather than 3 billion. The search becomes even smaller because each one of us has roughly 20 to 30,000 variants in that part of the genome. So what we do is we then comb through public databases of previous scientific studies to identify variants and narrow down the list of potential suspects. We had the added advantage of comparing DNA among Ariella's family members who also had the disorder. We all share a certain amount of DNA with our relatives, 50% with your parents and brother and sister, and 25% with your grandparents, and so on. So studying families allows us to only look at those shared regions shown in red here and essentially ignore the rest of the genome. This left us with 40 possible mutations shown in blue dots, that are shared among all family members. So this was still a lot of mutations to sift through to figure out which one might actually be causing the disorder. As we were combing through all of these databases, trying to investigate the biological function of all the mutations we had found, we learned that there was another family member who also showed features of golden heart, and he also happened to be right in the US. And he was only a few hours away. His DNA could help us narrow down the list much more efficiently. So we contacted him. He generously shipped a cheek swab with his DNA. And I went to the lab, extracted his DNA. But the few days travel in an envelope in some brutal summer heat had really damaged the DNA. This began my first scientific fieldwork a six-hour road trip from Cambridge to Philadelphia. Just to be safe, I loaded our lab cooler in the back seat in order to keep the blood sample cool on the drive back to the lab. Once I got there, it was incredibly moving to be able to meet the family, this family that I had only seen their, their DNA, and to see them in real life. So once we had collected the blood samples, I got back in the car, drove six hours back to Cambridge, and I went straight to the lab there was no way I wasn't going to get quality DNA this time around. The next morning, I got to work sequencing all 40 candidate mutations that we had identified in the other family members. And then the sequencing results came back. He didn't share a single mutation with the other family members. We were essentially back to square one. So we could go back, maybe sequence the entire genome, all three billion letters. Um, but this would be incredibly costly and time consuming, and we might even end up with a list of variants that was much larger. So we decided to sort of take a step back and zoom out and look at different larger types of mutations. So rather than a single change in a single letter of DNA, we scanned each family member's genome for large structural changes containing deletions or duplications of thousands or even millions of DNA letters. We did eventually find that there was essentially a copy-paste event of more than one million DNA letters, including several genes. 
This was not a eureka moment, as you might imagine. We still had work to do. We needed to gather sufficient evidence to prove that this was indeed the causal mutation. So we scanned databases of variants identified in previous scientific studies and found that this variant did not exist in any DNA from healthy individuals. We were finally convinced that we had found the causal mutation. Inspired by my road trip to Philadelphia, we officially assigned a theme song to this genetic odyssey, Eye of the Tiger, from the film Rocky, which was released in 1976, which just so happens to be a year before DNA sequencing was invented. We could relate to Rocky's symbolic run up the steps of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Despite numerous setbacks, we rose up to the challenge and were able to bring some closure to Ariella and her family. During the course of our study, Ariella was unfortunately diagnosed with medulloblastoma, one of the most common brain tumors in children. It turned out that the mutation that she shares with her family contains a gene called OTX2 that is highly expressed in this type of cancer. Ariella's doctors were actually able to use this information to guide her care. Our findings suggested a shared uh, cause between a rare disorder and a common brain cancer. Here she is on her 12th birthday, cancer-free. Since our study, other scientists have replicated our findings in other patients, confirming a role for the OTX2 gene in Golden Heart Syndrome. It's always reassuring to see scientists validate your discoveries, to see them stand the test of time, and to know that it can help other patients and their families. Of the nearly 7,000 known rare diseases, about 95% of these have no treatment. There are clearly many challenges ahead and a lot of work to do, but we have the technology to diagnose and transform how we treat them. Our understanding of human health and disease is the result of remarkable advances in sequencing technology. But it takes more than a village to diagnose a rare disorder. We could not have found the mutation that caused Ariella and her family's disorder without access to databases containing genomic data shared by other scientists. I wrote a policy piece with some fellow scientists that explored some of the legacies of the Human Genome Project and their current challenges. The more we learn about our DNA and the more genomes we sequence, the more valuable that data becomes. But due to privacy concerns, access to genomic data is becoming increasingly challenging. This is why it is absolutely critical to sort of strike a balance between individual privacy and scientific progress. The Human Genome Project was a model for global collaboration, perhaps its most important legacy. The more we work together to understand human biology, the better we can translate this knowledge into cures. Thank you.